I, because of my previous conversation with you uh, on, on this podcast, uh, Matthew Johnson from Johns Hopkins reached out and you said, but uh, he, he commented, I think, on something that we commented on, I don't even remember exactly what, but that there's not many studies, it's not being, uh, psychedelics and not being rigorously studied in an academic setting, like with the full rigor of science. And he said, well, actually, uh, that's exactly what we're doing and they're extremely well-funded now. And it was been a long battle to get it accepted as a serious uh, scientific pursuit. So, um, but, and I'd like to ask you a little bit about that, but sure. do, do, do you have a sense about connection between dreams and psychedelics or these uh, different explorations of mind states that are outside of the standard normal one that's mm -hmm. the wake mindset? Yeah, I loved your discussion with Matthew. I knew of the Hopkins group and the stuff they were doing, but I didn't know much about it at all. And I learned a ton from that podcast. I reached out to him just to say, love what you're doing. I think it's incredible. So yeah, your podcast has been a great source of uh, serious academic and intellectual um, conversation for me. Um, I think what they're doing at Hopkins is amazing. Um, he has a collaborator there, actually that had a very popular paper that I just throw out there for fun. Um, who was a postdoc at Stanford. Her name is Ghoul. Um, she's Turkish, I believe. Um, and her, and I, I apologize, her last name escapes me at the moment, but that's just a function of my brain. Um, she had a paper showing that uh, she put octopi on MDMA on ecstasy <laughs> and found out, this was published in, in a in current biology, showing it was a great journal, showing that the octopi then wanted to spend more time with other octopi and they started <laughs> cuddling. Yeah. So uh, their colleagues out there. But um, the, Hop <laughs> the Hopkins project is super interesting because I think they were initially supported mainly through private philanthropy. Mm -hmm. And now you're starting to see some more interest at the level of NIH about psychedelics. It's a complicated space because the psych psychedelics are always looked at through the lens of the 60s and people losing their mind. And there's a, you know, in, I always say, you know, you don't want a Ken Kesey out of the game. You know, Ken Kesey was amazing, right? Part of the whole beat generation thing. And he was actually at the VA near Stanford. That's where he eventually, in Menlo Park, he wrote One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, or maybe that was about him. Anyway, the comments will tell me how wrong I am, <laughs> but it's, I think I'm tossing these words in the general, in the right general direction. But, you know, Huxley, Keezy, they did a lot of LSD yeah. and they lo all lost their jobs, right? They lost their jobs at big institutions like Harvard and Stanford and elsewhere, or they left um, because they they made themselves the experiments. Yes, Hopkins, as far as I know, is one of the first places, if not the first place where whatever Matt may or may not be doing in his own life, I don't know. It's really about the patients and whether or not the patients in these um, mm -hmm. institutional review board approved studies, whether or not they're getting better in situations like depression. I think it's clear that there's a very close relationship between hallucinogenic states and dreaming of the sort that would describe for REM dreaming. Mm -hmm. And there's a, a terrific set of books and body of scientific literature from a guy named Alan Hobson, who was an MD, is at Harvard Med, and he wrote books like Dream Drug Store. Mm -hmm. um, one of the first neuroscience books I ever read was about hallucinations and how psychedelics and dreaming are very similar. That was way back when I was in high school, I was just curious. And he really understood the relationship between LSD and REM dreams and how similar they are. I think psychedelics, and Matt knows way more about this than I do, of course, but psychedelics have some very interesting properties. They are certainly not for everybody, right? And kids, it's a problem, you know. The, I think the major issues right now around the psychedelic conversation is that it's clear that they can unveil certain elements of neuroplasticity. They make the brain amenable to change, changing up space-time relationships, changing up the emotional load of an event and being able to reframe that. It's clear that happens. But there's two major issues. One is that people talk about plasticity as if plasticity is the goal, but plasticity is a state within which you can direct neurology. And the question is, what changes are you trying to get? To. So people are just taking psychedelics to unveil plasticity mm -hmm. without thinking about what circuits they want to modify and how. I think that's a problem. Mm -hmm. I think there's great potential, however, for people opening up these states of plasticity with psychedelics or otherwise and directing pl 
the plastic changes toward a particular endpoint. And there's an absolutely spectacular paper out of UC Davis, published as a full article in Nature just a couple months ago, showing that there are psychedelics that are now can be modified. So chemists have gotten into the game now and modifying to take away the hallucinogenic component where you still get the neural plasticity components. Wow. And for a lot of people would be like, oh, well, that's no fun. That's yeah. not giving you the, the, the wild experience. But I do think that that holds great potential for people that wouldn't otherwise orient towards some of these drugs. So I think it's really marvelous what's happening and what's about to happen. And I think there there is one drug in that kit of drugs that's very unusual, like psilocybin, LSD, those promote heavy, heavy serotonin release mm -hmm. and lateralized connections ramp up, et cetera. Matt talked about all that. But MDMA, ecstasy, is a very unusual situation where dopamine is very, very high because of the, the way the drug is designed. Dopamine release, it goes through the roof. So people feel great and they wanna move and they have a lot of energy. But serotonin levels are also high and that's a very unnatural state. And why MDMA may, may and I wanna highlight may, have particularly high potential for the treatment of certain forms of depression is an interesting question because never before in, as far as we know, in human history, has there been a possibility of opening up dopaminergic and serotonergic states at the same time, dopamine being the molecule of pursuit and reward and more and more, and serotonin being one of bliss and being content right where you're at. So it's almost like those two things wrap back on themselves and create this very unusual state and I think the bigger conversation is what to do with a state like that. Mm -hmm. Like, do you, is it about self-love? Is it about developing love for another person? Is it about forgetting hate? Like these are powerful molecules. And I think if the academic community and the clinical community is gonna move forward with them in any serious way, I think there needs to be a conversation about what they're being used for. Right, and, and coupled with that, I think similar to what you're saying, uh, like Matt has talked about, as others have talked about, some of the biggest benefits of like progress, whether it's like quitting smoking and all that kind of stuff, is in the is in the days after. It's the integration of the experience. So maybe you open up the brain to the neuroplasticity, but then there's like work to be done. It's not you're like you shake up something in in the, in the biology of the brain, but you have to do then it's work. Absolutely. A friend of mine who's a, a physician, he says, um, who's quite open to this idea that psychedelics could play a, a real role in, in real medicine, says um, better living through chemistry still requires better living. <laughs> and and I think it's a, it's a beautiful statement. I wish I had said it, Be, um, but he gets the credit. But the plasticity window opens. And then as you said, what are you gonna do in the two weeks, three weeks, four weeks afterward? Because that's the real opportunity. But those psychedelic experiences are really a case of an amplified experience inside of an amplified experience, so much so that everything seems relevant. Yeah. And it's um, it's it's fascinating. I mean, I my hope is that the AI and machine learning and the brain machine interface and all that will eventually be merged with the psychedelic treatments right. so that you, an individual can go in, take whatever amount of whatever's safe for them, working with a clinician and really direct the plasticity while maybe stimulating the orbital frontal, medial orbital frontal cortex or increasing the observer or decreasing the observer in the brain or decreasing the amygdala. I mean, it's doable. It's doable with transcranial magnetic stimulation and it's for shutting down activity and it's doable with ultrasound. Ultrasound now allows very focal activation of particular brain regions through the skull, non-invasively. So it's, it's approaching the same kind of uh, therapy from different angles. One of AI is the computational side sort of injecting like the robotics, I I injecting like maybe you can even think about it as like electricity, the electrical approach mm -hmm. versus then like the the chemical approach. Absolutely. And then the psycho and then the psychology is yeah. is subjective, right? So it's gonna take some real um understanding of what that person's um lexicon is like, you know, no, that wasn't a pun, sorry. <laughs> uh, uh, I'm sorry, it's terrible. I'm, I'm like the worst. That's the one thing I know from the feedback on my podcast. My jokes are terrible, but I never claim to be funny. The, the, uh, but somebody who they really trust and understands when somebody says, you know, for a very stoic person, like I'm imagining uh, you interviewed the great Dan Gable. 
Mm -hmm. right? I don't know anything about Dan, but can you imagine like you asked Dan, like, you know, how you feel about something while on one of these drugs? And like, <laughs> I mean, his languaging might, if he says that was troubling, it might mean that it was very troubling or not troubling at all. So people are, language is a poor guide because if I say I'm upset, how upset is that? Well, that's very subjective. So you need, we need, can you build a tool for that? Can you build an AI tool for that? Yeah, deeper, yeah, well. Maybe that's well, the eye, maybe that's our, this, that's what the eyes could reveal. So language is not just words, it's everything together. And that's one of the fascinating things about the eyes in the window to the soul. I mean, they express so much, the face, the eyes, the body. Um, I mean, Lisa talks about that, the communication of emotions. It's, it's a super complex. Perhaps it's a, a bit of a side fun tangent, but Matt, Matthew Johnson brings up DMT and the experience of DMT as a as a as from a scientific perspective just a just a mystery in itself uh, over its intensity of what happens to the brain and of course Joe uh, Rogan and others bring it up as a very different special kind of experience uh, the, and elves seem to come up often. <laughs> <laughs> I've never tried DMT. What allows for hallucinogenic states? Yes. And it, I mean, DMT is a really interesting molecule. There, there are a lot of people experimenting now with um, DMT. Um, and they just, the way they've described it is as a kind of a freight train through space and time. Very different than the way people describe LSD type experiences or psilocybin, where time and space are very fluid but it tends to be a kind of a slower role, if you will. Um, so it's clear that DMT is tapping into a brain state that's distinctly different than the other psychedelics. And, and you mentioned jujitsu and these other communities. I mean, it's, I think it's interesting because jujitsu is a nonverbal activity and people get together and talk about this nonverbal activity and they show great love for it. In the same way that surfers, you know, I, I've known some surfers in my time and they will get up at the crack of dawn and drive really, really far to sit in the water and wait for this wave to come. I have to imagine it's pretty fantastic. I think that human beings now, some of whom are in the scientific community, are starting to feel comfortable enough to talk about some of these other loves and other endeavors because they do reveal a certain component about our underlying neurology. Mm -hmm. I'm fascinated by um, the concept of wordlessness activities in which language is just not sufficient to capture and in which feel so vital as a reset, as important as sleep. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that's one of the dangers of the phone is not that you're gonna get into some online battle or that you're always staring at the phone, is that it's a word. So as we read things, we're hearing the script in our head. Mm -hmm. And I think getting into states where we are in a state of wordlessness is, is very renewing and replenishing and just, can feel amazing for, and I believe also can help us tap into creative states and allow our neurology to access creative states. And sleep is one such wordlessness period. So one of the most interesting things to me are states that one can approach in waking, non-sleep deep rest, wordlessness through, maybe it's jujitsu, maybe it's for some people surfing, maybe it's dancing, maybe it's just, I don't know, staring at a wall, who knows, but where the, language components of the brain are completely shut down. And it has to be the case that drugs are no drugs, that the brain is entering and starting to states and starting to use algorithms that are distinctly different than when we're trying to compose things in any kind of coherent way for someone else to understand. There's no interest in anyone else understanding what you're experiencing in that moment. And that's beautiful. And I think, uh, I think it's not just beautiful because it feels good. I think it's beautiful because it's important and it's clearly fundamental to our neurology. And it, your sense is there's a connection between dreams and DMT and like psychedelic, like all of the, uh, you can you can understand one by studying the other. So for example, dreams are also very difficult to study, right? But they're more accessible. It's yeah. safer to study. And we're so, told we need to get more of it. Whereas with psychedelics, there's this big question mark. Is it gonna make everyone crazy? Is it is it gonna be legal? I mean, it's kind of interesting how if one looks on Instagram, 
one could almost think that these drugs are already legal based yes. on the way that people commute, but they're not yet. There's yes. still a lot of them are scheduled. And there's a lot of questions. Yeah. Uh, uh, I mean, and but nevertheless, it's like uh, my my hope is that uh, science opens up to these uh, drugs a little bit more. It's just I have this intuition that, like a lot of people share, that they would be able to uh, unlock deeper understanding of our own mind. It's it's any kind of, same as studying dreams. Right? Absolutely. Well, creativity is in the non-linearities, right? But productivity is in the implementation of linearities. I mean, that's, that's what is absolutely clear. This is why I think we were talking earlier about why a formal rigorous training in something where other people are looking at you and telling you, no, not good enough, go back and do it again. There's real value to that because otherwise it's just ideas. It's just vapors. You know, one the thing that Matt mentioned uh, is the study that they're working on is as opposed to, I think most of the psychedelic studies they've done is on uh, how to treat different conditions. And one of the things they're working on now is to try to do a study where uh, for creatives, for people that don't have a condition that they're trying to treat, but instead see how this, how psychedelics can help you create. So like- oh, goodness. If you take creatives and you give them more psychedelics, they're not going to be able to get out of their room. I, I don't you know. That's, well, but this is the, I maybe you can speak to that, uh, psychedelics or not, or dreams or tools in general, how to be better creatives. That, that's an interesting, I don't often see studies of this nature of like how to take high performers in the mental creative space and get them to perform even uh, better. So it's not average people it's like masters of their craft, like taking, uh, I mean, his examples was taking an Elon Musk, which is in the engineering space and maybe musicians and all that kind of stuff and studying that. That's a, I mean, that's weird. I, usually the science, uh, the scientific exploration there has been done in uh, by the musicians themselves as right. has been documented. Well, like jazz is like all non-linearities, yeah. right? But if it's, but the people still have to know how to play their instruments. Right, right. There's some early, early skill building that's critical. I mean, when you mention someone like Elon, I mean, virtual. I mean, he's already a virtuoso, right? Because he and in so many different domains. I've never met him, but it's it's clear, right? He, it's not just that he's ambitious and bold and brave and all that. It's all that, and there's there's clearly a, a different way of looking at the same problems that everyone else is looking at. And people are probably banging their head against the refrigerator thinking like, think differently, think it doesn't yeah. work that way. It involved, there's a certain anxiety in for the, I'm not talking about for Elon, but I don't have no idea. But I think for somebody who's very structured, very regimented, very linear, the anxiety comes from letting go of those linearities. And for the person that's very creative, the anxiety comes from trying to impose linearities, right? The, the really creative artist or musician, they're, they seem nuts. They seem like they can't get their life together because they can't. Mm -hmm. And they, you know, we look at people who are kind of pseudo Asperger's or Asperger's or some forms of autism, and they are so hyperlinear, but you take away those linearities and they freak out. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of the essence of some of those syndromes. So I think that the ability to toggle back and forth between those states is what's remarkable. I mean, because we're here and we're having this discussion. I mean, Steve Jobs is a good example. He probably the best example is somebody who actually talked about his own process, mm -hmm. about the merging of art and science, art and engineering, humanities and science. Very few people can do that. Well, I-, I You seem to have a capacity to do that. I, I, like you, you know poetry and you are AI guy. Like you, there's nothing linear about poetry as far as I can tell. I mean, I, I do wonder just like we've been talking about if there's any ways to push that to its limits to explore further. I don't like leaning, this This is why I'm bothered there's not more science and psychedelics is I haven't done almost, I, so I've I, I eaten mushrooms a few times, uh, allegedly, but that's it, you know? And I the reason I don't do more, the reason I haven't done DMT is because it's illegal and, and it, it's like not well studied. And it, you know, I, I'm in those things, I'm not usually at the cutting edge, but I'm very curious and it feels like there could be tools to be discovered there, not for fun, not for recreation, but for like 
encouraging whether you're a linear thinker to go nonlinear or, or it's nonlinear to go linear, like to, to shake things up. You mentioned Dan Gable. The idea of Dan Gable on psychedelics is fascinating to me because he's such a control freak. I mean, he that I would control. show up for. That, that would I'd show up for. But like yeah. so much of these psychedelic experiences, it feels like is are letting go. That's right. You don't want to resist. But and, that's supposed supposedly where the growth is, in in giving oneself over to the process. And that's for people who are like master controllers. He's one of the greatest coaches of all time. It's fascinating to see what that battle looks like of resistance and then of letting go. Um, yeah, I mean, I I, I can't wait to. Uh, to, uh, to, to see where these studies take us. Well, it's clearly happening. You know, I've asked, there. I have a couple of colleagues at Stanford who are doing animal studies. I've asked around, you know, it's there's a lot of discussion in the neuroscience community about what the perception of a laboratory is if they uh, work on psychedelics. I mean, I I have to tip my hat to the folks at Hopkins. They are pioneers. Yeah. And as um, Terry Signowski, he's a co computational neuroscientist down at Salk says, I don't think he was the first person to say it. He says, uh, you know how to spot the pioneers? They're the ones with the arrows in their backs. Yeah. And you know, it's, it's an unkind world to a scientist that's trying to do really cutting edge stuff. My colleague, David Spiegel, who studies medical hypnosis, it's, he's got dozens of studies now showing that hypnosis can be beneficial for pain management, anxiety management, cancer outcomes. And it's finally, you know, at the point where there's so much data, but people hear hypnosis and they think of stage hypnosis, which is like the furthest thing from what he's doing. And I think mind body type stuff, hypnosis, uh, respiration and breathing. I think the hard science uh, walk into the problem is always gonna be best to get the community on board. And then it's up to people like Matt and um, to really, you know, take it to the next level. And as I say, not Keezy out of the game because Keezy basically was taking too much of his own stuff and he started dressing crazy of banana hats. And like, you see him, he had the, the magic bus. So, you know, the day, I, so like the day I start driving to work in the magic bus, that's the day I lose my job. Well, you're gonna, uh, I'm not into buses or, or, or wearing you, fruit. You, but um, you're gonna get a phone call from me, and I hope you do the same for me. It's like, uh, you, like, uh, dude, what are you doing? <laughs> well, what's interesting yeah. earlier we we're talking about the challenge with David that you're about to do. Yeah. I mean, that is a psychedelic experience of sorts because you're biasing your mind towards a pretty extreme neurochemical state, and you, you don't know what you're gonna find there. And that's kind of the excitement, I, at least for me as an observer. It's like I want to know what what the experience is like afterward. I want to know like, how was it? I mean, I'm sure you're going to get something. Like you said, you're going to grow. The question is how. And not resisting. I mean, it's the same as with a psychedelic experience. It's like not uh, like giving yourself over completely to the experience and not resisting and going through the whole mental journey of whether it's anger or excitement or exhaustion, the whole thing. It, it's, uh, I mean, uh, that's it the entirety of the process that David goes through when he does his own challenges and so on is that whole journey. He finds purposely like missile seeks the limits of the mind that, that whatever, whenever the resistance is felt, runs up against it and then goes through the full journey of going beyond it and seeing what's there on the other side. Well, stress has these two sides, the limbic friction of being tired and needing to get more energized. That's one form of stress. And then there's the feeling too amped up and needing to calm down. Yeah. The, the, the typical discussion around stress is one thing, but it's all limbic friction. It's just that when I say limbic friction, I'm, that's not a real scientific term. I just mean the limbic system wanting to pull you down into sleep or wanting to put you into panic and you using top-down processing, using that evolved forebrain to say, mm -mm, I'm not gonna go to sleep and mm -mm, I'm not gonna freak out. And those top-down control mechanisms are, I mean, when those get honed, that's beautiful because then you real you're increasing capacity for everything. You are